Hey, Dr. Drew here again on behalf of Heal, Heal.com. I've got Dr. Megna Motiani here today. She's an internist. She went to Northwestern University for undergraduate. Uh, she is trained as an internist like myself. And welcome, Dr. Motiani. Thank Person. you so much for having me. Appreciate you have being here today. We're going to talk a little bit about diet, right? Yes. Even that word has a negative connotation, does it not? Absolutely. And the important thing to recognize, right, is that the choices that we make with regards to diet and nutrition now have significant implications for whether we're, we're going to develop diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and even some forms of cancer nowadays. Mm -hmm. And just like you alluded to, right, the term diet automatically has these negative implications. In, in my experience, patients, when they hear that word diet, they all of a sudden start to think about the foods that they cannot or should not perhaps be eating, right? And, and you know, even further beyond that, I'll say that the, the word itself tends to conjure up an image of, of deprivation, of exactly weight loss. Exactly the word I was thinking of, deprivation. Exactly, deprivation, weight loss, and even sometimes just extreme changes in what we're going to eat, right? But in my mind, I think that really healthy eating comes down to making positive choices, putting a positive spin on it, right? Great. It's about learning what foods are going to give us the nutritional value that we need, right? And we can do this together in the context of our, our relationships with our friends, our family members, and even roommates or housemates, if that's, if that's uh, the case. When it comes down to uh, thinking about what we're going to eat, it's easy to discuss our preferences with one another, easier than one might think, okay? Sometimes we do this directly, sometimes we do this indirectly. Let's talk about, about how to uh, sort of manage that basic dietary structure. Sure. Do you have basic recommendations? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I think that there are a couple of good principles to live by. One is really that, uh, you know, live your life less out of habit and more out of intent. Make it a conscious choice that you're going to incorporate healthy eating principles into your regular routine. And, and use the information that you get from your general internist, from your family practitioner, or your pediatrician, and, and work from there. The second good tip that I think uh, is important to share is really be kind to yourself, right? Know that from the get-go, not every single meal is going to be perfectly well-balanced and perfectly nutritious. But using those principles that you learn from your doctor and, and going from there. There's a lot of, uh, I don't want to say controversy, but a lot of chatter online about what the balance of fat and protein sure. and carbohydrates ought to be in the carbohydrate sources. How do people navigate that? I think that that's the perfect opportunity to open up a dialogue with your physician, right? And the reason that I think that that can be beneficial and, and individualized is really threefold, okay? Uh, on the one hand, your doctor can really help to, to inform you know, a patient about how the choices that they're making about nutrition can impact their health status, right? Uh, on a secondary level, the doctor can really help uh, a patient safely navigate weight loss, for instance, if that's the goal. Okay. And, and you as a heel doctor will go out and have those conversations. Absolutely. That's been uh, one of the most gratifying things um, that I've noticed just in my interactions with patients as part of HEAL. You know, you may be called to uh, a patient's home to, to follow up on a cough or a cold, for instance, but it's a wonderful opportunity to address basic general physical questions or annual physical exam questions you might otherwise ask. Uh, it's a great time to review basic principles of, of, of uh, nutrition, of physical activity, of uh, you, you know, making sure that uh, patients don't have any other concerns that they may want to address. Would, are most doctors equipped to answer those kinds of questions? Will they be able to spend the time? Uh, certainly, heal doctors can, but the average doctor would they be able to? I like to think so. Certainly, you know, all physicians have a different comfort level with these sorts of topics, and our training and our backgrounds may differ. I found that it's actually, you know, quite common to bring up these topics in the context of an annual physical, or for perhaps in the, uh, you know, in the setting of a follow-up for diabetes or high blood pressure. It's easy to review the basic principles of nutrition and physical activity. And certainly, if you know, there are questions beyond what a clinician feels comfortable answering, we have uh, multiple resources that we could subsequently uh, refer our patients to. The biggest complaint I have for a motivated patient, somebody who's, who's right in that zone that you're talking about, that wants to talk to the doctor about it, who's motivated, is they will complain about cost of sure. keeping fresh fruits and vegetables, say, in the house, or certain uh, sources of protein. Uh, or time to get these things, and and I always feel a little overwhelmed when patients bring that up because I, I can't I can't undo the cost problem. Absolutely, you, you have to, and it does take time. I think that's where you know really being attuned to the social situation that a patient is coming from is so important, right? When we have a little bit more context about. Um, 
you know, what a family's resources are, what their time constraints may be. We can be more pointed in our advice to those particular patients. Right. right? And I think that's a wonderful aspect of HEAL in that we get to go, we have the privilege of going into someone's home and we can see right there and then what their life is like, what their day-to-day -day routine is like. Um, we can get the sense of um, you know, how much or how little time someone has to devote to things like physical activity or meal preparation. And let's go back into the family setting again. Let's say sure. we've got some kids at the table and they're picky. What's your recommendation for the so-called picky eater? That's a really good question, Dr. Drew, and I think that you know it's really important to remind people that that's a very common challenge that people face, right? Um, and I think there's two suggestions I might offer to a family struggling with that. First of all, make sure that everyone, every member of the family feels like they have a spot at the table, okay? Um, as I said earlier, I think it's important to ask each and every member of the family what their preferences are. The key there is also when you're making a meal, consider grabbing foods from multiple different food groups, right? So modeling options, those are sort of important headlines exactly. for Exactly. Yeah. The other thing that I think is important to bring up is really to, to not make that picky eater feel like they're ostracized or isolated. Or they're in a power struggle because as soon as you get into that power struggle, that's where you will stay. <laughs> Sure, right. and, and you know, I'll say, Dr. Drew, one thing that we do know from the literature is that when children feel like they have this regular mealtime routine with Structure. their family, exactly, they're more likely to carry forward, uh, you know, positive attitudes, attitudes towards health and wellness going forward in the future. Another suggestion that you, you know, can offer to, to uh, families that are struggling with a picky eater is really to make mealtimes fun, right? Cooking with friends and family can be really exciting. It can be very novel, and, and it can even spark an interest in a new hobby like cooking. Right? Well, th that's the first time I think I'm hearing you say, at least I heard you say, that the cooking process should be part of those. Absolutely. I've, heard, I've heard the choices and the availability. But the and process the, itself can be one to I'd not, enjoy. I've not thought about that. That's when very social. You know, when you're uh, incorporating children into the meal-making mm -hmm. process, you're not only teaching them how to, to build, so to speak, mm -hmm. a healthy meal, right, but you're also entrusting them with the responsibility of completing a task. And when, when we are assigned a task, we feel responsible for it. We right. feel vested in the meal. Right. And we're more likely to eat what's being prepared. And, and to be fair, we're really talking about healthy people, health and diet management, but there are people with medical challenges that you and I both know, whether Absolutely. it's feeding tube issues, whether it's diabetes, whether it's chronic neurological illnesses, or can, other things. I mean, each have their own dietary issues that your physician absolutely will be in a position to help you with. Absolutely. So. Well, Dr. Motani, thank Mochiani, right? Yes. Mochiani, Dr. Mochiani, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it very, very much. Thank you so much for having you me. You bet.